Okay, and so we might need to. Okay, um, so thanks, Jean Pierre. Now, Jean Pierre, uh, as you've already heard, is from the Quebec um, Heart and Lung Institute and also has an appointment at uh, Department of Kinesiology at University Laval. And he's going to tell us that there's a miracle, an uh, anti obesity pill just around the corner. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Boyd. I, I, I think uh, the computer has uh, eaten some of my slides as well, but the talk will be uh, shorter. You know, the, the question what should we hope for a miracle uh, anti obesity pill? And on the next slide, I was supposed to give you the answer. I don't have the slide, no worries. The answer is a big no, um, of course. So from a public health standpoint, uh, this big issue that we've been talking about for, for three days, obviously pharmacotherapy of obesity is not the solution. Let me expand now a little bit on the issue of obesity. You might have heard me over and over the last three days uh, raising the issue that we need to go beyond the BMI. Now, from a public health standpoint, shifting the curve you know, of the BMI is per per perfectly acceptable, but in clinical practice, a given BMI is associated with the, uh, substantial heterogeneity in, term, in terms of risk of diabetes, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and, and cardiovascular um, disease. So you all know very well that this has been the traditional inclusion uh, criterion, which has been used, uh, however, in weight loss trials that have been lost, uh, conducted over uh, 20 years or so. But we could run a, a risk assessment clinic this afternoon here. And let's see that in the room, for the sake of the discussion, we have, let's say, 100 patients, all with the same BMI. Let's see, 32 kilograms per meter square. And we assess blood pressure, insulin sensitivity, lipids, and so on, clinical signs of vascular disease or heart disease. We would find remarkable heterogeneity. Some individuals would be perfectly healthy with that BMI of 32, and others would be, would be sick. And, and the reason for that is, is a matter of, of body shape. And I always pay tribute to Jean Vague, who uh, more than half a century ago was really the first to suggest that the complications of obesity are a matter of body shape rather than excess fatness per se. But it took more than 30 years before these remarkable clinical observations received support from uh, modern prospective uh, studies. And now with the development of imaging studies, magnetic resonance imaging, computer tomography, and we began that work now more than 20 years ago. I've been repeating myself for 22 years. You take a group of individuals with the same amount of total body fat. 20 years, 20 years ago, we reported that those with a selective deposition of fat in the abdominal cavity, condition that we call visceral uh, obesity, was the sub, represented the subgroup of overweight obese individuals more likely to be characterized by a whole minestrone soup of abnormalities, increasing risk of, of diabetes and cardiovascular um, disease. And you probably have heard that the buzz around this terminology, you know, metabolic syndrome, as this minestrone soup of abnormalities, increasing uh, risk of uh, cardiovascular disease. But, but on the basis of the very tight link between too much fat stored in the wrong place, and the features of the so-called metabolic syndrome, who have made the, the point over and over for the last uh, 15 years that, again, abdominal obesity associated with too much fat at the wrong place was the, represented the high-risk form of overweight uh, uh, obesity at, at any BMI level above uh, uh, 25, actually. Now, with, with the, the development of, um, of imaging techniques now, we can do the full mapping of uh, lipid deposition, regional uh, lipid uh, deposition. And in an update review on abdominal obesity that I will publish in, in circulation in a, a couple of weeks, I will emphasize now that we have plenty of evidence from the imaging data that we have that uh, excess visceral uh, adiposity is actually just a, an excellent marker of uh, excess ectopic fat deposition and that probably a very important ectopic fat depot is liver fat. And all the evidence that we have linking excess visceral adiposity to complication, you can find essentially the same evidence linking excess liver fat to a complication. And you have all now the pericardial, epicardial fat, perirenal fat, intramuscular uh, lipids that are also associated with, with uh, uh, metabolic abnormalities, that, uh, which are going to define whether or not a given body fat content is associated with uh, metabolic abnormalities or, or not. Now, in the context of pharmacotherapy of obesity, therefore, there is healthy functional adipose tissue. And the point that I'll make today is that in many weight loss pharmacological trials, those beignets de Renoir have been put on pharmacotherapy. 
whereas uh, a minority of uh, patients in those pharmacotherapy-induced weight loss uh, uh, have been put on, on weight loss drugs. And uh, more than a decade ago, actually, I, I published this, this editorial in the British Medical Journal emphasizing at the time we had cybutramine, we had the dexfenfrumine, we had only a, a few drugs. But when you scan the literature, there was very, very little evidence that actually when you were dealing with those high-risk form of overweight obesity associated with uh, in altered intermediate risk factors, that indeed pharmacotherapy targeting this high risk form of, um, of overweight obesity would be associated with, with clinical benefits. Now, those of us interested by lifestyle modification, prevention of, of diabetes, or, or prevention of atherogenic metabolic abnormalities, this emerging evidence now that have been published for more than one decade that I've shown that if you start actually with those individuals with too much fat stored in the wrong place, you reshape their nutritional habits, you reshape their physical activity slash exercise habits, with a moderate weight loss of 5-10%, you can induce a substantial loss mobilization of those ectopic fat depot. You can mobilize liver fat by 50, up to 50%. You, you can mobilize this visceral fat by 25-30% with a 5-10% weight loss. And needless to say, that if you start with this, those individuals with those constellation of metabolic abnormalities, that rather trivial weight loss, 5-10% weight loss, will be associated with substantial improvement in the uh, risk factor uh, profile. And again, with the development now of sophisticated imaging study, we can do the mapping of this regional mobilization of fat. And just showing you here, some preliminary, preliminary result from a, a, an intervention study that we did in post cabbage patient with coronary ar artery disease requiring coronary artery bypass graft procedures. So patient really sick with, with documented coronary artery disease. Lifestyle modification program, again, just reshaping their nutritional habits, physical activity habits after one year, little bit of body weight loss, 5%, substantial loss of visceral fat, look at the substantial loss of pericardial, epicardial fat. And now again, with this imaging technology, we are in a position to nicely document that that little bit, little bit of weight loss in the right patient can go a, a wrong way. Now, if we look at history of uh, pharmacotherapy of obesity, weight loss has been the end point. And I'll just give you a couple of, exa of examples because I only have 10 minutes that the, in the majority of these uh, uh, tr pharmacological trials, the wrong patient population had, had been used. This is a very nice trial here showing by, published by uh, my good friend Tom Wadden showing the added value of a lifestyle modification program added to, uh, I'm going to take two more minutes there because I spent some time looking for my slides. You chew up my slides, you, you are going to give me two more minutes. <laughs> That's the deal, showing you, therefore, that if you add, indeed, um, a weight loss drug to, uh, and combined to a lifestyle modification program, you see you, you get that nice body weight loss after a year of about 12 kilos. Let's look at the patient population now. You, see, you have the female-male ratio. You see 80% women in those groups here. And you look at the lipid profile and you look at the cholesterol to HDL cholesterol ratio. I'm a lipidologist by training. This is what we aim for you know, this epidemic patient, they were put on a weight loss drug. Not legitimate. Nice proof of concept though, but not legitimate. Loss castorin has been approved by the FDA this week, as a matter of fact. This is the very large Bloom trial which was published uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Again, if you look at the very large population of patients here, more than 3,000 patients, and you look at the Male-female breakdown, again, you see 80, more than 80% 80 of those patients were women. Look at the blood pressure, 120 over 76. That's pretty good to start with. And they were put on a weight loss drug. Uh, so if you look at the pharmacotherapy of obesity, there's been a series of failure stories. I won't have time to, to go through those uh, this afternoon. But this is an ad that was put in a national Canadian newspapers by a marketing genius working for a pharma company, marketing all this that. Do you think this is the, the right way to go? Positioning pharmacotherapy of obesity in the population? Shame on this guy. So what should be our target in high-risk obesity? 
Where should we position pharmacotherapy if it is legitimate? I'd like to propose to you that first of all, you need to focus on the high risk uh, population with too much fat stored the wrong place. We have tried to do that with the CB1 antagonist Remonabant, which has been removed from the market because it was associated with an increased relative uh, risk of uh, a depressive uh, episode. The drug should have been niche to a, a, a subpopulation of patients. History has shown that it, it has not been possible. And I'll stop with this. Uh, this is the conclusion a, of a review paper, sort of a post-mortem analysis that we did on the whole history of Remonabot. And uh, if I may, I'll take one minute of your time to read that for you. Hopefully, the clinical need for optimal management of residual risk in patients with visceral obesity will not be sidelined by the fake promise of huge and rapid financial gains for the pharmaceutical companies nor by the unconstructive negativity that usually follows apparent failures of clinical trials. The so-called magic bullet for obesity, which seems to be heralded by the media each time a new molecule with anti-obesity potential becomes available, clearly does not exist. I repeat, clearly does not exist. Rather, development of the right drug for the right patient is the key. Furthermore, constructive dialogue with the regulatory authorities will be necessary to ensure that phase three studies with more clinically relevant endpoints than the magnitude of weight loss are performed in uh, the future. So there's healthy adipose tissue where, again, the risk of uh, uh, pharmacotherapy clearly outweighed the benefits. There's unhealthy dysfunctional adipose tissue where the benefits may, and I underline may, uh, outweigh maybe the, the, the risk if the proper studies are uh, conducted. And I'll stop here by just uh, inviting you to visit, for those of you interested by this issue of abdominal obesity, to visit our website, uh, myhealthyways.org, which is visited by 125 countries. You can download a whole lot of a series of slides set uh, if you're interested by, by this question. And uh, I invite you to the next week, uh, 10 days from now, we'll have the third international meeting on, on abdominal obesity which will be held in Quebec City, and it will be in July, so the weather will be warm, I promise. Thank you very much for kind attention.